football is a game controlled by money. Let's let's just put that on the table. If you don't like it, I, I don't know what you're doing in football. You know, things that happened in the first year where we didn't know what the hell we were doing, all got bad advice and, and you know, made mistakes. You know, these people are morons. And the problem is most people don't understand this. So the reason I like Bitcoin is you can't print anymore. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. I'm out if I'm out of my debt at step six mm -hmm. as a British person from from my town of Bedford, he as an American going into the dugout of a League Two side with a good history is definitely out of his debt. The problem is we get lumped in with them because people see Bitcoin and crypto as NFT. They think it's all the same thing. I don't give a crap about any of that stuff. I care about Bitcoin. So football can be the same. You can do everything right and that bit of luck can screw you up. And when you're in fine margins business, that's tough. That's yeah. really tough to deal with. But that's also what makes it so exciting. Yeah. Hello and welcome back to my channel. And today's guest is Peter McCormack, who is the owner and chairman of football club Real Bedford FC, who currently play in the ninth tier of English football. So there is a twist to this story. So Peter actually purchased a club, which is his hometown club, about a year and a half ago with the sole intention of trying to get them up the leagues and eventually into the Premier League, believe it or not, harnessing the power of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin. So if you have any interest in Bitcoin, you may already know who Peter is. So he hosts a very successful podcast called What Bitcoin Does with over 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. And so I was curious to speak to Peter, also to ask him a little bit about podcasting too. But in this episode, we speak about what it's like owning a club, the challenges he's faced, how he is trying to achieve his goals with the use of Bitcoin and what kind of struggles he's had so far and what he expects to see in the future. So actually a really, really interesting conversation. And there's some links down below the video to check out Pete's podcast, but also some things that Peter refers to if you do want to learn a little bit more about Bitcoin. So before we get into the conversation, I do want to quickly ask you to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Please do like the video, share the video. Everything helps to grow the channel and attract guests on such as Peter. So Without further ado, let's get into a conversation with Peter McCormack. Okay, Peter, welcome to the channel. How are you doing today? I'm good, Chris. How are you, mate? I'm um, really good, thank you. Really appreciate you accepting to do this. Um, you're quite an interesting chap. You're a little bit different to the guests that I've had on previously, but nonetheless linked to sport. So we'll get into we'll get into that a little bit. You know, obviously more detail in terms of what role. Sorry. Who do you normally have? Who do I normally have? So basically, it's, I'm an analyst by trade, so mainly analyst coaches, and I've tried to delve into different kind of sporting roles, so like goalie coaches, scouts, heads of recruitment and stuff like that. Um, but I wanted to just branch out and kind of, I want to get more people in business on and kind of in more senior roles and stuff. So you are the chairman and owner of a football club, um, which is very, very interesting to say the least. So, but it comes with a little bit of a twist. So for those that don't know who you are, Pete, so... I've been kind of aware of you for a number of years. Anyway, I followed you on Twitter and the likes, and you've got your own podcast. <laughs> you've got your own very big podcast, I should say. Um, but for those that don't know who you are, Pete, if you just want to give a, a quick introduction. Yeah, I'm Peter McCormack. I'm from Bedford, uh, little town in Bedfordshire. Uh, and uh, I operate a podcast, uh, which is called What Bitcoin Did. And uh, from the, the title, you'll probably guess what it's about. Uh, I think it's one of the most misunderstood topics. So most of the time when I explain to people about Bitcoin, I'm usually having to start at the very start and deal with the things they don't understand about it. Uh, and I have obviously, as you're aware, I've connected uh, the two worlds of Bitcoin and football for my local team, Rail Bedford. Perfect. So you've combined that with with your love of football, Pete. So you are a football fan by, you know, who, who's your team? Is I, I think it's Liverpool, is it? Bedford, come on. Oh, okay. Apart from Bedford. <laughs> yeah, no, look, I grew up a Liverpool fan. Um, naturally, living in Bedford, a good four hour drive from Anfield. I, I picked Liverpool as my team. Uh I wasn't I wasn't really aware of non league football as a kid. Um, it was all uh, the old division you probably I don't know if you're old enough, but the old division one. Yeah. And then <laughs> uh, then we then we got the Premier League with Sky Sports. Uh and I wasn't really aware of non league football. I didn't I didn't even know that we had this local team called Bedford. Mm. Uh, and then as you get a bit older, you know, driving up to Anfield, um, you, you don't, you don't really get the buzz in the way that say I did for England yeah. because England, I had a passion because uh, mm. it's my country and Liverpool, just the team I supported. And when I, I started to go to watch the occasional Reading game, because I was born in Reading, it was mm. a bit nearer. 
And when I went to the away Reading games, you'd see the the group of fans. Or even I sometimes go to away Blackburn games with my dad. Mm. You just saw how much it meant to people because it was their local team. And I was just like, do you know what? I wish Bedford had a, a team yeah. in the football league. And so uh, over the last six, seven years, I've been trying to devise a way to take control of a team and have a plan that can get a, a Bedford team into the football league. Yeah, perfect. So it was a very, very lofty goal. I mean, I, I'll, I'll admit I've never, ever been to Bedford, uh, so I don't know what I'm missing out on, Pete. So um, you mentioned, I don't, I don't think there's, in terms of the location you are, you're kind of dotted between what, kind of Luton, Northampton and somewhere around there. Bridge, Milton, yeah. So, the, so the, really, We've got, you know, we're in a good spot in some ways. I was listening to this non-league podcast yesterday uh, and it was a guy, what was the team? Um it was one of the teams up near Manchester, and their competition is Man U, Man City, yeah. you've got Oldham's, you've got Salford, Stockport. So there's a lot of competition up there. Yeah. Whereas here, right, you you have got Luton, who are now a Premier League team, but you know it's not like a lot of Bedford people feel an affinity with Luton. MK Dons in, in Milton Keynes, but nobody likes them. Uh, you've got Cambridge United, maybe Watford, but. It's not like people in Bedford go, oh, I'm in Bedford, I want to support one of those teams. Yeah. You do get some with Luton, but you, you just as likely to support Watford as well, Arsenal, really, because it's just not the same town. So, in some ways, we're in a good spot. If we, if we can get this going, get this to really pick up a, a pace, I think we could be a very well supported team. You kind of take, taking over the club, it was late 2021, wasn't it? So, kind of. If we just go back a bit before that, Pete, so obviously you've got this podcast which you've been running sort of, is it 2017 you started the podcast? Yeah, November like November 20th, 21st, 17 was the first, first episode. Okay, perfect. So I'm just kind of curious to what you were, what, what, who was Pete before owning the football club, the podcast, where did the podcast come about and where did your interest and affinity with, with Bitcoin kind of start first? Yeah, so I um, I used to work in advertising uh, on the digital side. So uh, I worked for 20 years in uh, digital agencies, web development, email marketing, social media, search engine stuff. And in I had an agency down in London, did all right. Yeah, we had a, a you know, 35 full-time staff, uh, office down in Covent Garden, decent turnover. Mm. And I got married in 2013. That marriage ended really quickly and it was pretty brutal. And over the space of the next year and a half, I just stopped going to work. I got fed up with it. And I didn't really like the job anyway. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, the problem with advertising or marketing is you spend a lot of time kind of bullshitting people, really. Your, your goal is to bullshit people. And I, I, and I, I, I like, uh, you, you'll know the film Jerry Maguire. I always like what he did when he wrote that piece at the start, the things we think and do not say. And I kind of, I did a similar, I wrote this piece called online advertising does not work. Yeah. Uh, to try and spark my clients and the industry to talk about the nonsense that people do. And uh, it got a lot of interest, but didn't really do what I wanted. And and in the end, I was like, you know, I'm done with this. So I quit. I took a year off work and I was traveling a lot out to America and I you know, discovered Bitcoin. I was like, well, what's this all about? It seemed kind of interesting. And because I had a lot of time on my hands, I would you know, spend a lot of time like reading about it, reading about the economics of Bitcoin yeah, understanding issues with central banking and government money. And you know, just as, as people say in Bitcoin, I went down the rabbit hole with it. And um, at the same time, I'd met this uh, other podcaster called Rich Roll, really interesting guy. He's like a vegan ultra athlete. Yeah. And uh, we're spending time with him. And I said, look, I, I really like your life. Like, how do you do this? I, I, you, your life is you just fly around and interview people. And I want to do the same. So, yeah, he kind of mentored me, told me how to do it. And I that, mm-hmm. that year in November, I launched a podcast and, you know, nearly six years later, here I am talking to you. Yeah, perfect. So I know you because when I first reached out to you, you just crossed you crossed basically the hundred thousand subscribers on on YouTube. Obviously, I'm sure you, however many million downloads a month, I don't, I don't know. So it's a so you seem to be pump out a lot of a lot of like very regular videos, which is I don't know how you do it to be perfectly honest, but I'm sure you, you I'm sure you enjoy like you say what you do. It's it's a great thing to do just to kind of speak to different people, learn from them as well. Um, and you, like you say, you're kind of earning a living from it at this stage, so it's it's perfect. Um, so yeah, really interested. Um, you know, just to speak to you about the podcasting, really. But let's get back to the, the football. I know that's what people probably want to hear about. So um, you've kind of stumbled. You mentioned that you stumbled into Bitcoin. You've kind of experimented with that, and kind of that's kind of grown over the years. So 
when did buying the football club, when did that even, when was that even a thing? When did that first enter your mind and why, basically, Peter? Uh, I, the first time I started to think about it was back in uh, 2000, late 2017, early 2018. There's a there's a te- another team in Bedford called Bedford Town. Mm. And uh, their owner at the time, I, I knew was losing interest. They weren't really going anywhere. So we made a, like a soft inquiry, me and my friend Tom, about trying to acquire it. I didn't really have the money or the plan, but I was kind of interested. And mm. and then they ended up being taken over by another guy, a guy called uh, John Taylor, who's done a really great job. He got them up to step three uh, two years ago. Uh, and... About, I don't know, about two years ago, I was thinking about it a lot through COVID, thinking, look, how do you do, like, how do you take a team from the lower ends of the non-league into the football league? How do you do it? You know, Wimbledon did it. Well, Wimbledon did it because they got deserted by their club for Milton Keynes, and they started essentially afresh, but they had 4,000 fans coming to the game, or two, yeah. whatever the number was. That's a lot of people coming, which mm-hmm. means a lot of ticket revenue means you can sign good players. Yeah. And so I, I started speaking to a few people around football and, yeah, you know, look what Salford did. And I, and I realised, look, we all have to accept football is a game controlled by money. Let's, let's just put that on the table. If you don't like it, I, I don't know what you're doing in football because that is the base reality. It's competitive sport. Yep. Teams are out there to win and they have to find their edge. And some of their edge comes from the manager. Some of their edge comes from having a good crowd. Some of them comes from... You know, the brand they create around their team, like the attitude, mm. a large percentage comes from the players they can recruit. And whether that's through their academy or whether that's through signing players. So I knew, look, there's a reality. If I wanted to take a team up into the football league, then we needed to have the finances to do it. And so I was thinking, well, where can I find an edge? And, you know, over that four years from 2017, 2021, my podcast had grown. I got half a million followers on Twitter. I, you know, millions of people listen to my podcast. Mm. And, you know, Bitcoin people are like an interesting bunch in that they very much, you know, support their own. Yeah. So I was like, well, why don't I just make this the team that the Bitcoiners want to follow? If I make us the Bitcoin team, then that's going to give us an edge. And in the world where football's controlled by money, if you're a local team, the money you get comes from people coming through the gate. So if you have 250 people come to a game, and they spend a tenner each, you bring two and a half grand in yeah. and whatever local sponsors you can get. Now that's, that's not a, a massive budget, but it's an okay, but you might get you an okay budget. But if you want to dominate the leagues and make sure you can go up through them, well, if I'm the Bitcoin team, not only do I have local people come to the game, local sponsors, but I have international sponsors yeah. and people around the world following and buying the merch. So, as, you know, just as a one signal, we sold 2,000 shirts in our first year. We're, we were a step six team. We're, like, we're in the 10th tier of football. Most teams at that level probably sell 20 shirts or 50 yeah. shirts, 100 shirts. We sold 2,000. We sold £120,000 of merch in our first year. Now, we won't sell that this year, but but that gives you an idea. And most of that is being shipped to America, Australia, you know, all around the world to people who like Bitcoin, who want to wear our shirt and support us. And so that, so yeah. And then, then obviously we've got, you know, great shirt sponsors. And so what that enabled us to do is invest in the infrastructure, invest in the team, get a great manager in. And, you know, first year, last year, step six, we won the league by nine points. So we won the cup. Great. Can, can we do that again this year? That's the big challenge. And can we do that six times in total? We've done it once. So five more, can we do that and get into the football league? And I'm not, not naive about this. This is going to get progressively a harder. I already know step five is going to be much harder than step six. Yeah. But can we can we do that? Can we make this football project work? Very exciting. So yeah, you mentioned there. So the 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 club that you initially kind of had that kind of soft approach to, they are a couple of tiers, a couple of levels above um where you're at now. But you started 10th One. tier, you got promoted last season, you said you won the double. Yeah. Uh, so tick one on the on the first year. Um, how I mean, it, for yourself, you mentioned at the start like you you don't really know non league, so it's kind of I mean I don't really know non league especially, so I, I don't wouldn't even know how much of a step up that is from the ninth the tenth to the ninth. Is it going to be much much more harder? Is it going to like what's your squad looking like? Have you had to bring in much change for next year? And and kind of how does that look? Yeah, so it is a big step up. There's a couple of notable differences. Uh, firstly is 
obviously the quality is higher um the players are fitter and the uh there's the, the teams the the quality is a lot tighter so the difference between the top and the bottom in step 6 was huge okay yeah. i th- it's going to be tighter if you go and look at the results from this first uh, uh from tuesday and wednesday only one team scored three goals which was fc romania uh, yeah, and the most you know most goals were most games were won by a goal. They're very tight games, and that's my expectation. That's that it will be a lot tighter league. Yeah. Uh, teams are harder working, and so so it's more than just signing the best players. You want to have the best players, and we've signed eight very good players. Mm. But you're gonna ha- you have to have a good manager, and you have to have a way of breaking teams down. You have to be relentless. You've got to have a yeah a, an ethos that runs through the team. Your winning mentality. Uh, and then on top of that, you've you've got to grow your infrastructure and your support and everything around the team, which is, you know, there's a lot of work involved in that. But we're doing it. You know, you know we, we, we aren't just building a team here, Chris. We're building a club. Mm. And so alongside this team we want to get promoted this year, uh, Bedford Girls and Ladies, or Bedford Ladies and Girls, who we partnered with last year and gave their first team kits and uh, expenses to their ladies, they're now Rail Bedford Ladies. They're still a separate entity but they play under our brand and all players all 270 girls age under seven up to the senior team we're kitting them all out and we've given them we've got a new manager and given him a good budget and so we're doing that we're also working on early plans because we need a training center at some point we'll need a new ground we're working to upgrade to our facilities Mm. so whilst the goal is promotion 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 there's all this other stuff that's going on in the background that we're having to do to make this club work yeah um but yeah, I mean, look, there are some good clubs. It'll be a tough, tough league. Uh, tough league. We've played one game against a very strong MK Irish. You know, we won, but we were fortunate. I mean, mm. they had they had more clear cut chances, but our ke- keeper pulled off two unbelievable saves, and then our striker Joey Evans, you know, came up and finished his chance. And I think that's what it'll be like. It, it, this year will come down to. I think this year will be a little bit more luck, and then. Uh, how the team does in those important moments. Do your strikers finish at the time they need to? And are your defenders and your goalkeeper putting those tackles in at the time? There will be, it will be fine, fine margins that define the season. Fine margins. So you mentioned their first game, 1 1 0. So that was, you stream the games as well, don't you? They, they, yeah, we do. So you... that's part of our trying to build this international audience. You, you Look, everyone else will know it with Wrexham, they'll see what Ryan Reynolds and uh, Rob McAvenny have done their brilliant job. They've built this international community. Now they're out there touring America as a league, yeah. a league two side, playing against Man U in sold out stadiums. I mean, yeah. unbelievable what they've done for that club. I'm, I'm basically trying to do the Bedford version of that. And so, yeah, we stream our games, and yeah, sometimes we get five, six hundred. We have had up to a thousand. Mm. Economically, it probably doesn't even make sense. People, are, why are you doing that? It costs us sixty grand a year to do. But that is to build our international audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there could be a Netflix special in a couple of years. Then, Pete, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I don't know if Netflix will want me. I'm, I'm not as handsome or as charismatic as uh, those Hollywood film stars. <laughs> so, in terms of your role, then you're obviously your chairman. So, what what does that look like? How does your time split between um, Real Bedford and obviously what Bitcoin does? So, obviously, two big important things going on. I mean, what do you do in terms of the club involvement? Well, so in every, I mean, I've got three, essentially four strands of business. I've got the podcast, What Bitcoin Did. I also make films, documentaries. Uh, I own a bar here in Bedford and I own the football club. Mm. And with any entity, I always have one person who is operationally in charge of it for me. So Danny runs the podcast. My brother essentially is the guy behind the films. Uh, The football club is Emma and the bar is run by a guy called Gian. Uh, And I think when you own something or a chairman or a, CEO, how you run and operate a business will differ from how other people will. I'm probably very different from many chairmen at football, other football clubs. Um, but in terms of football club, I, I very much am, you know, my manager, Rob Sinclair, who's brilliant. He is everything on the pitch and I'm everything off it. Mm. You know, at no point does he ever, or will he ever feel any pressure for me to sign someone or to play anyone. That's entirely his remit, and I will never cross that line. And I do everything off it. So all the kind of lunatic, crazy branding and marketing I do with skulls and playing heavy metal at the ground, that's all me, and that's my decision. 
And so that works really well for us. Um, the thing is about foot, running a football team is it's like no other business. The amount of crap you have to do is endless, endless stuff you have to do. And so for me, it's just finding good people you can trust and rely on to do those things. And yeah, I really see the role of a, a of a CEO as leadership. You know, yeah. it's hard work with football. It's mainly volunteer. A lot of people giving up your time. You have to hold that flag up and hope everyone comes along with you and says, I want to be part of that because people are giving up mornings, evenings, weekends. On Saturday, we're off to Clacton for the FA Cup. And Tuesday, I think, we're, is it Tuesday? We're playing Bulldog Town. Then we're off to Cock Fosters the next Saturday. You know, it's relentless amounts of travel, evenings, weekends. It's, you know, doing stuff without being paid, all for the hope at the end of the season you pick up a trophy, which we did. So your first goal is to get everyone on side. That's a really important thing. Uh, and 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 then it's to, you know, you know, to to look at the economics of what a football club is and and see how you can excel in that. What can you do? Where mm. can you get better sponsors in or sell more merch or it? And that's really it. You know, the chairman is direction and money. Yeah. So yeah, because everything everything in football will come back to money. We want to sign a player. Can we afford it? Uh, we want to upgrade the clubhouse. Can we afford it? So I've got to make sure that we can afford to do as many of those things as we want. So all those fine margins, if we're just 1% better than everyone else, in the end, hopefully that leads to more titles. Yeah, definitely. So just on that, and the, you mentioned earlier about the 2,000 shirts being sold and the, the revenue, how would that compare? So because you, you're quite transparent, you release you know, the, the, the PDF you re- release in terms of the, the strategy and the results and stuff like that in terms of uh, the revenue that the club's had. So... You know, with that transparency, how does that kind of compare with, for your, like we say, 10th tier last season, your revenue, what the club was able to bring in through sponsorships, et cetera, last season, how would that compare to an average other 10th tier club? Where are you, are you kind of getting the similar revenues of a, of a National League club? Or a, do you, I know you probably don't know the full extent of everyone else, but just to kind of I, get... No, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. I, I'd, I'd purely be guessing. I... I I mean, look, I would have thought Wrexham and Notts County's wage bills would have been a couple of million. Yeah, yeah. Again, I don't know. I certainly think we are comparable to some high step three, low step two teams, maybe even a step one, but I don't think so. Mm. Uh, and and then that gets a bit interesting because so people go, well, hold on, what, you've got step three budget? What, you brought in half a million pounds? Mm. Like, we're bringing in 40 grand. How yeah. are you doing that? That's going to mean you've got so much more money for players, but it doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when you go through, you say, okay, what was your budget? How much do you spend? Well, we spent 60 grand on streaming. Okay, that's gone. You know, we spent, um, uh, we got all new uh, merchandise in. And even though we sold 120 grand's worth, we actually didn't make a lot of profit because, yes, we sold 2,000 shirts, but we ordered 3,000. So we had 1,000 spare. Yeah. What the hell do we do with those? You know, there was a lot of of you know things that happened in the first year where we didn't know what the hell we were doing. All got bad advice, and and you know made mistakes. Um, we spent a lot of money at the ground. We had to refurb the pitch. We had to get an irrigation system put in. There's no, there was been no investment at the ground for a long time. Mm-hmm. So suddenly, once you got to start going through, it's like okay, you, you can chip away at that quite quickly. Um, mm-hmm. That said, we still did have a decent budget for the players. Yeah, but we didn't go too far with that. And one of the reasons being is you can almost sign players who are too good for a level. Yeah. I don't think you want step two players playing at step six. Mm. One, I don't think they'll care. And two, I don't, I, I think it's a different type of game. You kind of want good step. If you want to win step six, you kind of want some good, a mix of best step six and some good step five players. Yeah. That's my view. And then step five, you want a mix of good step five players and some step four. And yeah. so, yeah, in terms of the budget, that's, you know, we're, we're trying to be sensible and reasonable and we're trying to retain money as well. You know, we have some big costs coming in the future on training ground and and and, uh, and, and our own ground. And we keep, we want to keep money by for that. Mm. Yeah. So in terms of them, the players that you bring in then, because it's it probably easy for a player just to think, well, okay, this club's got a bit of money. I'll come there. I don't really care. Is it important to you that they buy into the, the 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 whole picture really in terms of growing the team and the vision that you have um in terms of the players that you bring in not exactly it's important 
that they buy into the vision of the manager. So yeah. the manager, I give him the budget and he signs the players that he wants. They have to buy into him and his vision and what he wants to do. And yeah, of course there are mercenaries out there, but they're easy, they're easy to spot. They're yeah. so easy to spot. Um, if we were just a club with just a high budget, we would have that. But people actually want to play for us. We're a nice club. We treat everyone well. All the players are well looked after. You know, if they have injuries or things, we you know we have a good physio. Lottie really looks after them. They all get good new equipment. And you know, we look after and treat our team well. When they go to training afterwards, we feed them to make sure they're fed. Yeah, you know, and they eat well. Yeah, you know, we yeah you know, any away team that comes to us, they will. You know, they know we treat our, our away teams well. We treat everyone well and we do it properly. And so that kind of information spreads. When people come, they're like, "Wow, I." I didn't get this at my last club. I, you know, I didn't have this equipment or I didn't, you know, they didn't feed us because it, teams are on a tough budget sometimes. Yeah. And so, yeah, there are mercenaries, but yeah, we weed them out. If you look through our team, look at the players we've signed. They're not cocky. They're not, you know, full of themselves. They're not, you know, uh, they're not people who are going to disrupt the dressing room. They're nice people. Ben Stevens, we got from Kempston, like what a nice lad. Joey Evans, we signed from Moulton. like the nicest person I've ever, like literally the nicest footballer I've ever met. He comes up to you after every training session and says thanks for everything. Uh, Mo Ahmed, you know, really nice lad we got from Newport, the winger. These are nice people who are good at football, who want to go and win leagues. They're not uh, self-centered, arrogant journeymen who are focused on themselves. But that's all that credit goes to the manager. The manager has built the team he wants. Yeah. Yeah, it's good that you don't get involved. I think you probably admit that that's not your remit. Like that's not your strength in terms of the the football inside. So let the the manager get with that. So, well, I'll give you a good example of that. So I was talking to my manager, and I was like, "Yeah, do you know what? I wouldn't mind sit, sitting back and watching one of the games uh, with you sometime, and just like understand how you watch a game." Yeah. The you know he was just explaining to me as like, "Yeah, you know I, he likes to uh, he he says he pays so much attention to stuff that's happening off the ball." I never look at that. I'm literally, where is the ball? And I'm following it around, like hoping it goes in the net. But of course he does. He wants to understand like how his players are doing on and off the ball. And so that's why I don't get involved in any of that stuff because how you watch football as a fan is very different from how you fo watch football as a, a player or a manager. You yeah. understand the game in a way it's very different. Yeah, I've realised most of us who are on a terrace yelling stuff at the the, the manager we actually don't know what we're doing. <laughs> That's true. And most of us, if we have, we're put in the role of manager, we get stuffed because we don't know what we're doing. Because all we see is the individual elements that lead to a goal one way or the other. We mm. don't understand the bigger picture. Yeah, definitely. And that's what, like I said to you before, a lot of the uh, viewers on this channel, I come from an analyst background. So a lot of people watching this will be coaches and, and analysts and kind of understand exactly where you're coming from there. So uh, just just on the the kind of sticking to the financial side of things then, Peter. So it, obviously Bitcoin's a huge part of the club in terms of you've got this, the Bitcoin treasury that you you, you post about. So I mean, can you just explain what that is and, and kind of what what the purpose of that is in terms of the longer the longer term? Yeah, so just explain very simply first why I think Bitcoin is important. There's multiple reasons around the fact that it's decentralized, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's permissionless. It, as a form of money, it's the best money there is. It's you, know, you can spin up a wallet, send me an address right now, and I can instantly send that to you. And it doesn't matter whether you're in you know, Bedford, Bangalore, Sydney, Russia, I can instantly send it to you. So in form, as a money to transact with, it is the best. There's no banks in the uh, in the middle. Uh, question: Who are you sending that money to? Why are you sending it to them? Yeah. Or blocking transactions? There's no. They don't get lost. They don't have. Um, yeah, rent seekers like American Express or Visa taking a big chunk. It is just good peer to peer money. But an even more important version of money. So. The big topic of the day at the moment is inflation. Everyone knows inflation. I think the Bank of England today are going to come out with their uh, uh, with their new interest rates. We've got high interest rates because we used to have such low interest rates. The government was lend able to lend out loads of money, and uh, uh, and that meant we had a property boom. Now we're, we've got high inflation that you know, they're trying to rein people in. Now the central bank is constantly playing with money. The government constantly prints money. I mean we've got. Two trillion of debt, something now. Uh, our our annual debt 
interest payments are 120 billion a year. We spend 70 billion a year on education. So mm. stupid decisions by the government to borrow more money and live beyond its means means we now spend more on interest payments, just paying off the interest, yeah. not the debt, the interest, than we spend on education. Now, these people are morons. And the problem is most people don't understand this. So the reason I like Bitcoin is <clears throat> you can't print anymore. There will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin. So what you tend to see is inflationary periods where the government's printing lots of money. Over those periods, Bitcoin will tend to increase in value because it's limited. Yeah. And that, to me, is a very good asset to hold. So if you think long term, say our football club made a £100,000 profit. And I thought, I want to keep that for 10 years because in 10 years, I think we will need to build a new stand on our ground. Well, if you've got 10 percent inflation the next year, that's going to be purchasing power of 90 grand. Even though it's 100 grand, things have got more expensive. How much is that going to be worth in 10 years? It's not going to be buying you 100,000 pounds of stuff. Inflation is a horrible. It's, it's, it is it is the greatest fraud that is enacted on us as people. It is it is pure theft. You know, and some of your people might be listening, going, "Who's this crazy conspiracy theorist?" <laughs> on Chris, no, no, like you, the, the facts are there. Just go and look at inflation. It, 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 yeah, even two percent inflation affects the poorest the, the most, and so it is a it is a theft from poor government uh, monetary policy. And so I want to have an asset. I want to know in ten years, will my hundred grand that I've earned buy me more or the same amount of stuff yeah. in ten years? Well, I've got three options. I can hold the pounds. Well, then that's a melting ice cube. I could buy gold, but that's a bit of a pain. And where am I going to keep lumps of gold? Or I can have digital gold, which is Bitcoin. And I I, I think it's a fairly safe bet that my purchasing power of those 10 years in Bitcoin will go up. And so, yeah, when we make profits, we put them into Bitcoin, knowing we don't need to spend that for 10 years. And we know that that is a better, safer, more secure way of holding our money than holding it in pounds. Yeah. So is that what you, so part of the money you make, you would always just shelf a little bit to the side and that would be building up the treasury over time? Yeah, so we, um, I think we've got about five Bitcoin in there at the moment. So that's about, I don't know, what's that, about $150,000-ish. Uh, I'm pretty confident that in 10 years, that'll still be, it'll buy to, in, in 10 years, what 150,000 would today. Mm. Uh, and so what we do is you can buy things in Bitcoin. If you come to the ground, you can buy your tickets, your burgers, your merchandise, or you can buy things online. And some of our sponsors pay in Bitcoin. It's about 10% of our turnover-ish, 10 to 15%. So what we do is anything that comes in Bitcoin, we just leave in Bitcoin and forget about it for the long term. Yeah. So for the people that are watching this that don't have, I mean, where can people go to, learn about some people may already know a little bit but where where can they go to learn a little bit more about bitcoin peter in terms of if they just haven't got a clue what you're talking about well i mean i know a really good podcast it's called what bitcoin did it's hosted exactly. by me but the, uh, the starting point i actually always send people to there's a really good article it's called the bullish case uh case for bitcoin it was written by a guy called vj boyer party uh he wrote a book as well that followed it but you can find the article on medium it's just a very very good primer on bitcoin because what it does it will explain money to you and then it will compare yeah, uh, uh, sovereign money, pounds, dollars, to gold and to Bitcoin. And it will show you the properties of them. And from that, you'll get an understanding of what it is. Most people are scared off by Bitcoin because of the volat volatility. Um, and I understand that. That's kind of like a, that's part part of uh, being a Bitcoiner, putting up with that. But th that's, a, that's a good starting point. And then I've made like s nearly 700 episodes about Bitcoin and finance and economics. Yeah. Perfect. So I'll, I'll link both of them below. And you mentioned the, the volatility there, um, Peter. So you're doing a bit of research in terms of when you first got into it. There was, what, 2016? When is that? Well, the first time I actually bought Bitcoin was actually in 2013. I think I paid £80 for it, but I don't have that anymore. Okay. Then I probably got back into it uh, very early 2017. I think it was about $600 or £600. So you rode that all the way up and then you rode that all the way down. Yeah, I mean, I've rode it up and down two or three times now. But, yeah, it, each four-year period, uh, uh, I, my net wealth is in a better position and the money I've kept in Bitcoin has proven to be the right decision. Yeah, perfect. So, yeah, I'll link those below, below for anyone that does want to learn a little bit more. So just on the, um, what we're calling it, the thing that you, the strategy document that you that you published, Peter. So um, one thing in there is about the the fans, because you mentioned, obviously, money that you can get from from kind of sponsors worldwide, but the 
I'm sure you want to build that community within Bedford as well. So yeah. what, what have you seen in terms of growth in numbers of people coming through the turnstiles? Because obviously I'm sure you want to grow your revenue from that and not rely too heavily on on the sponsorships. Absolutely. Look, we want to be a, sustain, a sustainable club and we want people in Bedford to you know follow us and support us. So I've got the strategy doc in front of me. So the first year we were averaging 40, 50 people coming to a game. And then we had like a little spike up at Christmas and the first game of the season where you maybe get 100. Mm. Uh, our first game of last season, I think, was 297. Uh, we had, I think it was about the same for our um, New Year game. And then our final game of the season, we got 327. Uh, and when we picked up the, the league title. Uh, so Tuesday was our first game of the season. A uh, bit nervous with it being a Tuesday, to be honest. We're like, mm. oh, how will we do? You know. I was like, worst case, it might be a 120 because people are away. I expect 150. But, you know, if things go well, we'll have 200. We had 362 come. It was massive. So we beat uh, the start of last season on a Tuesday, but we did it on a Tuesday night and we beat our best game. I mean, I was blown away by how many come. And if you want to, if you can compare that to, um, yeah, the other, I've I've actually got the numbers here. So if you actually look at the other games in our, because you know our division, the Spartan Premier League, yeah. uh, London Lions at Crawley Green the other night. That was last night. I think they had forty-one. FC Romania Sawbridge. I was at that game. That was ninety-six. Mm-hmm. Alzi Cock Fosters was eighty-five. Uh, there were some bigger ones. Dunstable Aylesbury had two hundred thirty-five. But we're essentially a new team that's been going two years, and we got three hundred sixty-two. So what I'd really say, it's not like oh, it's not like ah, oh, ha ha. Look what we've got. You've got. It's like I'm actually trying to say to people is you can you can do this. Yeah. You can build a crowd. Um, and it's really just comes down to, I'm going to say like words that people won't like, brand and marketing. You know, we have a brand, we're Rail Bedford, we're Scum and Crossbones and we play heavy metal. Mm. Um, you know, we're a punk rock team and we've done lots of marketing, lots of community outreach and we've managed to grow our crowds from you know, 40 to 360. Mm. Every other team can do that. You've just got to work harder and go out and do it. And like, I want them to. I would happily open source everything I've done. Any chairman, I mean... I'm not like saying we've done a lot here. There's still small crowds. But if any chairman was looking, go, God, I wish we could do that. They can call me. I'll, I'll just tell them everything I've done because yeah. I want more people going to non-league. Uh, I don't want... Yeah, I'm a hypocrite because I was a Liverpool fan. But if I saw a dad and his two kids driving up to Liverpool on a Saturday, I'd be like, I want you, you should be coming to Bedford. Mm. Come and support us. Yeah. Yeah, nice. nice. And uh, Well, I'm presuming you've had people from from all over like have you had people fly in and to, yeah. to, to come from the, from the community yeah we had a guy coming from brazil um he was uh well i said he's a private jet pilot he emailed me he said i've got to do a uh, leg into london how do i get to bedford so he came to the game on tuesday uh we've got a guy coming from sydney our last game of the season we had 15 coming from the u.s uh when we played Holmer green we had 12 slovakians came in on a trip together to come to watch the game we've got this like we've become like a pilgrimage for bitcoiners they're like, we need to come, we need to go to Bedford and witness the team. And they come into this little town and come to our shitty little ground and come watch us play. But but it's fascinating. It's like, yeah, yeah we've got, I mean, at the start of last season, we had 70 supporters clubs pop up around the world. Now, most of those didn't actually want to do anything, gave up, but we still got like 35 supporters club. Yeah. There's one in um, uh, Minneapolis and the guy, he came over for a week, spent time with us and every game he gets a crowd of people down the pub to watch us, whether it's seven in the morning for him or, you know, in the afternoon. It's it's, it's weird and fascinating. <laughs> you, you mentioned the ground there then, uh, Peter, and you've also mentioned previously the, the plans to kind of build the infrastructure and the and the facilities. What What is the goal then? What are you looking to do longer term? Are you wanting a new training facility? How, how does that kind of look and, and how how long do you think that will take to, to kind of fund? I don't know how big of a project that would be for you. Yeah. So I think, I mean, look, I th- my rough estimate is what I want to do is about a 5 million pound investment in terms of you know, a grass training pitch, two full size, three G pitches, uh, a couple of nine a sides and a seven a side, and then a you know, clubhouse, et cetera. It's about a 5 million investment for us. There, There's multiple reasons to do it. There is sustainability. You know, it can generate revenue. Uh, there is the um, football pathway reason. So our ladies and men's team, the, there's a pathway for kids to come up through and, and play for a senior team. At the moment, the pathway is Luton and MK. That's where all the best players go. We want them to stay in Bedford. They want mm. to be part of this. 
Uh, there is the community benefits for doing it, like having this place, this center. There is the facilities requirement because you know, we don't have the best facilities for you know, training. So there's endless reasons to do it, which why every other club wants to do it or does do it. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we're in the early stages of that. I'm both trying to find a site and trying to work on the funding. Uh, but it's something I'd, I'd love to get done in the next two years because it's desperately needed. Yeah, sure. Perfect. So um in terms of what what would you say what do you say to the um the doubters peter because i remember when you first announced this there was lots of obviously support from the but then there was also the other side of that and thinking who is this guy he has no idea what he's doing what he's getting into so what what do you say to them and how has that kind of evolved from when you first shared the idea to to kind of where you are now well at first i get it i mean how many people have come into football and said i'm going to get i'm going to get this 10th tier team in the premier league or yeah, I'm going to sort and and how many grifters have come in and destroyed football clubs? I mean, look what happened at Crawley Town last year. I mean, it's dreadful, and they've crypto people. You know, we get thrown in the same bucket as them. So look, I get it. Um, I all the criticism and doubt was valid and deserved, right? You should put pressure when people come out with grand claims. They should they should go out and prove it. Um, so I'm I'm okay with that. Um, what I would say is, look, we're one year in now. We delivered a league title and we delivered a cup and we now have you know more facilities, more resources for both boys, girls and ladies football in Bedford. So it isn't just like an ego project that people said, oh, it's just his ego. It's it's a community project. So there's lots of people benefit from it. So I would say that. Uh, but there's a different group. There's the haters as well. So you have the doubters and the haters. Yeah. But the haters, I mean, you can't really do anything about those kind of people. They spend all day on Twitter hating anything. Um, yeah, and when they say things like, oh, you're just a money club or you you can only do it because you've got money, it's like, well, yeah, no, we can do this because we've got money. And what I would say is back to them, it's like, football's a business. yeah. And so the best teams are usually the best businesses. So what? why do you have a problem with there being a good business? Because if we're playing our payers good wages, it means our players are getting you know, rewarded well. It means good players come into our town. And they will spend that money in our town. And, and that's good for us. And yeah, if we're paying our ladies the most. Brilliant. I want our ladies to be the most well-paid in our league because mm. they should be paid. They're they're working for our club. Mm. Yeah, most ladies don't. They, they're covering, and they have to travel a lot further. We went to Wroxham last year. It's a two and a half hour drive. Yeah. They have to pay the petrol for that. I mean, sh they should be paid. They're working for our club. And, and then you look at 367 people came to our game. They're spending money in our town. Mm. we've had those 12 Slovakians they well no, another one I put an event on last year at the end of April um the Swan Hotel the hotel was fully booked yeah but there's money coming into our town so if I I, I really think if you're a hater because of the money you, you kind of sound a bit like a communist because you're hating successful business yet business is good it creates jobs and opportunity mm. you know, prosperity is important it raises up everybody yeah. we now have a we have a 12 grand hardship fund that is a fund that the boys or ladies team that can access and say, look, we've got a kid here. They want to play football. Their parents can't afford it. Can we have hundred pounds for a pair of boots or whatever? I don't know what a pair of boots cost these days. Can we have 150 quid for their signing on fees? Like, yeah, like they're, we're trying to get to a place where there's no kid in Bedford can't play. There's, there's, there's every kid who wants to play football in Bedford can and economics or money or finance is never a reason not to. That's what we want to get to. So if you're hating, it's like, what were you hating for? What, what do you hate? You, mm. you hate me because you think I'm a bit of a loud mouth? Fair enough. All right, fair enough. I'll take the one on the chin. You're hating us being successful? Why? Yeah. Yeah, why? Yeah, that's a good point. So you you, took, you mentioned Crawley then, uh, Peter. I mean, do you know much about that? Like obviously, uh, from the outsider, I can obviously that you mentioned they're a crypto company that kind of yeah. obviously doesn't seem to have gone too well. They didn't get relegated last season, but they obviously struggled oh, with it. Went through a lot of managers. I mean, are you able to share any thoughts on that? I mean, do you, I don't know if yeah. you know about that. Well, so in the problem is we get lumped in with them because people see Bitcoin and crypto as NFT. They think it's all the same thing. I don't give a crap about any of that stuff. I care about Bitcoin. To me, it's a it's a good form of money. Um, it is a commodity. It is regulated. It is we have digital money. It is just digital gold. That's all it is. All these other crypto things usually go to zero. They're usually worthless. They're scams. They're 
uh, uh, they're just ways to extract money from people. I'm I'm not really interested in them. I, I, go and do what you want with them. Um, I think the guy who bought Crawley Town bought it with a, an idea, but didn't know what he was doing. Um, and uh, I think he's, it feels like they're destroying a good club. I like mm. Crawley Town. Yeah. And I've watched them get people to buy NFTs and all that nonsense. We don't, by the way, we don't do that. We've actually got an article on our website. It's called Why You Should Not Buy Bitcoin. <laughs> and the reason being is you shouldn't go and buy Bitcoin. You should learn about it. You shouldn't go and buy it. But they they had people queuing up getting their NFTs and all that nonsense. And and they went through three managers, I think, in the season. There, there was a moment where the, the chairman was in the dugout and he was asking about substitutions. Also. I mean, he's out of his depth. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, but by the way, I'm out. If I'm out of my depth at step six mm. as a British person from from my town of Bedford, he as an American going into the dugout of a League Two side with a good history is definitely out of his depth. And I just, I don't know if there's a thing where you shouldn't criticize other chairmen. Maybe you shouldn't. Maybe there is like it's a club that you shouldn't. No, I, I think he deserves criticism. I think what he's what he's doing there is terrible. Mm. I think he should he should quit. We should hand over control to. Um, uh, the fans, because I think he could destroy that club. Mm. Yeah, it is. It does seem like it's going only one way, and that's not good. So, um, in terms of the, so you've been, so you've owned the club for what? So it's a year and year and a half, is it? Yeah, year and a half now. Year and a half. So, what would you say is the any anything unexpected, unexpected challenges? What you probably didn't even know would be a thing or a struggle that you've kind of come at, come at, come through basically in that time. Yeah, it's a good question. There's loads. Mm. Um, I just don't think you you can ever truly understand how much stuff needs to get done. You know, so at a home game, you've got to have, make sure the dressing rooms are clean and tidy. Then you've got to get all the kits laid out for the players, the refreshments for the players. You've got to get the bar stocked. You've got to get the food sorted. You've got to get stuff for the opposition committee. You've got to get stuff uh, for the referees. You've got to get the gate manned. You've got to have your ticket system working. You've got to do all your social media updates to let people know the game is on. You've got to get your merch stuff manned. You've got to get your stewards ready. You've got to get the pitch ready, the pitch marked. You've... And by the way, and you sometimes you do all this, and then there's a freeze, and you get up in the morning, and the game's cancelled. <laughs> yeah. um, you've got to get food sorted for the players. You've got to do all your reporting to the FA. You're reporting to the league. It's just an endless to-do list of stuff. <clears throat> wrapped in hundreds of rules of regulations that you're constantly scared that you'll get something wrong and be doc docked points. Yeah. It's there's just so much to do. I mean I've got ideas about the by the way, I think the FA is brilliant, like in, in a lot of what they do, but I've got so many ideas for the FA and the league and what they could do better. Um the other thing is people badly want you to fail. Mm. They really want you to fail. They want you to lose and they take massive pleasure in you losing. And then they want you to slip up. They want you to say something stupid publicly and cancel you. Or, yeah, they really want to trap you. They want to, and it's it's horrible, really, because you know, free speech is important. It's important that we can discuss and debate any kind of idea so we, you know, so we move society forward, so we understand each other. But here, I'm constant, and, and I'm a bit of a lunatic as it is, but I'm constantly worried about, God, what, what might I say that might get me cancelled or get get the uh, get the virtue signal tribe to come and come after me? And it's happened; they've tried, mm -hmm. so that's difficult. Um, but I say all that; it's it's the most fun mm -hmm. you could ever have running a football club. It is because it's so different, right? So, like, I, I think I'm an all right businessman. I've built three or four. Small, decent businesses. Never, never anything super big. I'm not, not that good. But with a football, with every business I've built, it's quite, it's quite simple rules, you know. In terms of make a good product, be good at marketing, look after your team, you do all right. Mm. Do all this, but then you've got this ninety minutes once or twice a week that you cannot control. Yeah. You can, you can even give the the manager the best budget and the best, you know, he gets the best team. You can go out there and they can play brilliant. And the decision goes the wrong way and it costs you points. Mm. It's the weirdest thing in the world. Yeah. You know, there's this element, it's like poker. Poker is what 80% skill, 20% luck. Yeah. The best player in the world can make the right decision in a poker tournament down to the final two. He can go all in pocket aces. 
and he can get called by pocket kings and the king comes out in the river and he loses. He did everything right. Yep. Football can be the same. You can do everything right and that bit of luck can screw you up. And when you're in fine margins business, that's tough. That's yep. really tough to deal with. But that's also what makes it so exciting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, like the other night, MK Irish, I would say, were the better side. Mm. You know, we did okay. Yeah, you know, we defended well and our keeper did well, but they were the better side and we won. Now they leave that game thinking, feeling hard done by, and I leave that game thinking, well, phew, yeah, you know, we got a result, uh, and that's that's the magic of this. We're gonna go. We're playing FC Clacton in the uh, FA Cup on Saturday. It's our first time in the FA Cup. How exciting is that? Yeah, we, we've got Bulldog Town coming to us on Tuesday. Got no idea what's gonna happen. That's exciting. All this stuff is so exciting. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't even know off the top of my head, but how many games you probably got? A- Play in the FA Cup to get to the first round is that it's probably quite a it's lot. Like seven, seven or eight. Seven or eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's not likely, but no, no. we'll have a go. Have a go. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So cool. I'm close your time, Peter. So I just want to want to quickly ask in terms of let's say what would you class it into if you can look three five years into future? What would be success for you? I mean, how many promotions are you realistically looking for in the next? Three years out. What not just promotions as well in terms of the infrastructure? What would be a success for you in? Yeah. In five years' time, I mean, success for me is it's a hard one to answer because you you don't want to come across as in the wrong way. But I want to go into every start of every season saying we can compete for the league title. Mm. So I'm I work one season ahead, and so I I'm not saying I think we'll win the league this year, but I'm planning for next year if we do. So mm. what happens when the season's done? I'm ready. I've got everything in place so we can do the same again. But I just want to temper that and say, listen, I'm not saying we will do it. That's how I work. Because I want every year for my manager, I don't want our manager to go, wow, Mitte will be good, but like we might get a chance at playoffs. I want him to go, this is what I need to win the league, and I want to be able to give him everything else. So for me, success is three more promotions. Mm. I'll take two. (laughs) Three more promotions. And then in terms of the club, in three years, I would love to have our training center established. That for me, training center established, a couple of promotions for the men's and a promotion for the ladies, that would be a good three years. Mm. Nice. Perfect. Perfect. So, Peter, I appreciate your time. You know, it's been great to chat with you. I'm going to link yeah, you your man. podcast below. I'm going to link you're on top. So you link your Twitter below so people to, to learn a little bit more about you and also learn a bit more about Bitcoin and the the journey of the of the football club and I'll make you a promise I will come to a game. Yeah. Uh, where so, are you? Uh, Doncaster. I'm in Doncaster. Oh, are you a, are you a Donny fan? No, I'm a I'm a Sunderland fan. So Sunderland fan. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, an interesting one to come to if you can do it is on the 26th of August. We're in the FA Vars and we're having a Bitcoin meetup before it at 12. So you okay. can come down to a Bitcoin meetup and watch yeah. a game. 26th of August. Nice. I'll I'll try. But I'll, if it's not that one, I'll definitely I'll definitely come to a game. But no, I appreciate that. So Peter, really appreciate your time and <clears throat> kind of accepting to come on. Um perfect. Have a have a great day. All the best for the season and hope to see you kind of get that promotion that you're that you're looking for. All right. Thanks, buddy. You take care. Yes. Bye.